do you have a preference? We were sort of debating. Yeah, I don't. I think we don't. We don't really care. So I don't really like the ending. Okay. Wait, I'll stand. Stand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Serena Mayeri, and I'm chairing this amazing panel on the unfinished business of sex equality. New Scholarship in the Legal History of Women's Workplace Rights. Um, we're going to be hearing from three wonderful scholars of women's legal history. Today, um, I thought I would introduce them, um, each of them, before they speak, if that's okay with you guys. Um, and um, so our first presenter will be uh, Catherine Turk, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas at Dallas. She earned her BA and PhD in history from the University of Chicago, and her dissertation received the Lerner Scott Prize from the Organization of American Historians for the best dissertation in women's history. Her forthcoming book is called Equality on Trial, Sex and Gender at Work in the Age of Title VII. It analyzes struggles to interpret and implement workplace sex discrimination law from the 1960s to the 1990s. She has already published articles in the Journal of American History, the Journal of Women's History, and Law and History Review, among other journals. Um, and I'm going to be saying this with each speaker, but, uh, but go out and get these books as soon as they come out. They're all going to be wonderful books. Without further ado. Oh. So thanks so much to everyone uh, for being here. Can you? Yes, OK, you can hear me. So my paper is called Evaluating Women's Work, Sex Equality Law and the Comparable Worth Movement in the Post-War Office. In the mid-1960s, new sex equality laws seemed primed to remake women's status in the labor force. Yet the contours of these rights, uh, of the rights promised by these new laws, were not self-evident. In particular, legislators, labor and feminist groups, and women workers debated whether the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 could be fulfilled merely by allowing women to enter and earn equal wages in male-dominated jobs, or whether creating me meaningful equality required employers to more fundamentally alter their business practices. One major campaign to extend the reach of sex equality laws was the movement for comparable worth. Comparable worth advocates claimed that the statistical difference between women's and men's average wages, which for decades had hovered around 40%, reflected dangerous myths about women, their labor less valuable, their tasks less skilled, and their wages less significant to family subsistence. This wage gap they boldly concluded, represented persistent sex discrimination manifested in the systemic devaluation of feminized work. In rejecting the unfettered market as an unbiased arbiter of fairness, comparable worth advocates argued that employers needed to transform the ways they valued and compensated feminized labor if sex equality at work was ever to be achieved. Comparable worth represented a radical threat to the long naturalized gender division of labor and the logic of late 20th century capitalism. <clears throat> its trajectory challenges the framework of the liberal 1960s, the radical 1970s, and the conservative 1980s through which many scholars have understood the struggle for working women's rights in those decades. Government officials first introduced comparable worth during World War II as a way to protect the high wages for industrial work temporarily being performed by women. In the early 1960s, comparable worth had powerful advocates in feminist and government circles. Yet in the 1970s, when the grassroots feminist movement had become strong and savvy enough to leverage sex equality laws, they largely ignored the issue of comparable worth. Instead, debating the meaning of state-enforced sex equality in terms of formal versus substantive equality. But in the 1980s, a decade scholars have characterized in terms of progressive activists' demobilization and rollbacks to hard-won rights for working women, public sector labor unions began to win major comparable worth victories. These gains ultimately proved to be mostly ephemeral, as the comparable worth allies in government positions in the 1960s had been replaced by more conservative opponents to comparable worth two decades later. Thus, comparable worth has yet to be implemented, not because of a timeless mainstream consensus that it is too radical, 
but in some ways because of poor timing. Its advocates in the government and labor and feminist movements never synced up when their power was at full strength. When feminists advocated it in the 1960s, comparable worth was not among union leaders' top priorities. In the supposed radical feminist 1970s, comparable worth fell out of feminist lexicon almost entirely. Only in the 1980s did the union-led campaign for comparable worth appear before judges and government officials, but in a new political context and to very mixed results. This paper will explain how this chrono chronologically disjointed, just disjointed narrative matters when thinking about feminism over three decades, but also how this history has helped to produce our contemporary climate. In the end, the lack of a comparable worth moment of convergence has meant that the low wages that were once justified by sex-based arguments have become the norm for workers throughout the service sector, whether male or female. And while the wage gap between working women and men has narrowed, it has stubbornly persisted up until today. So the theory of comparable worth is premised on the notion that the difference in pay between working women and working men reflects the cultural devaluation of feminized labor, and as such, it's unjust, even if the disparity is unintentional or matches prevailing market rates. The concept of setting wages in terms of the value employers absorb from individual workers has never been un uncontroversial. In his classic 1867 text, Capital, Karl Marx declared the futility of such efforts. The wage, he said, represented nothing more than the slightest possible amount the worker needed to maintain his living conditions and continue laboring to the capitalist's benefit. Marx wrote, uh, and the difference between the wage and the value a worker created was pure profit that the capitalist would always seek to maximize. As late as the mid 20th century, employers routinely and openly paid different wages to men and women for identical work, even when they worked side by side. Employers justified the sex-based differential by making reference to women's alleged distinct abilities, preferences, and domestic responsibilities. But comparable worth entered mainstream political debate in the United States in the 1940s as unions feared that lower rates of pay for the women who took up the industrial jobs men had left in order to fight overseas in World War II uh, would permanently depress the wages for returning veterans when they came back to take these jobs back. Led by the International Union of Electrical Workers, unions began to argue that pay rates should reflect labor's worth to the employer rather than the sex of the worker. The War Labor Board issued a unanimous 1943 opinion that endorsed setting women's wages based on the value created by their work. At war's end, the Women's Bureau of the U.S. Department of Labor urged the War Labor Board not to abandon comparable worth, uh, and some prominent legislators agreed. In 1945, and in each of the next 17 years, one or both houses of Congress considered, but ultimately rejected, equal pay legislation containing a comparable worth provision. In 1962, advocates of comparable worth almost won a new federal law to implement it. Pressured by women's lobby groups in Washington and encouraged by the final report of his commission on the status of women, which advocated comparable worth, President John F. Kennedy proposed legislation that called for equal pay for comparable work. Yet in the version of the Equal Pay Act that was adopted by Congress in 1963, legislators re replaced the word comparable with equal as a compromise to appease conservative supporters whose withdrawn votes threatened to defeat the bill entirely. Thus, while comparable worth did not become law in the 1960s, the theory had considerable mainstream support among elite members of government and feminist networks as a common sense protection for working women. By the late 1960s, feminism had become a widespread grassroots social movement. Throughout the 1970s, feminist groups like Boston's 9 to 5, located right here, um, framed boosting women's workplace rights as issues of economic and personal liberation. They argued that the sex-segregated workplace reinforced outdated stereotypes about women's inferior abilities and their natural position as appendages and sort of help meets to men. In terms of pay, 9 to 5 proclaimed clerical's right to compensation for overtime work, uh, to benefits, and life-sustaining wages. They viewed raising pink-collar pay as one way to improve working women's lives, uh, briefly and sporadically exploring comparable worth as a strategy. Uh, but the group took no significant or independent steps towards implementing comparable worth. 
workplace-focused feminist groups like 9to5 also split their energies in some ways uh, between improving feminized jobs and helping working women to move up into male-dominated positions. Thus, members use statistics about workplace sex segregation and unequal pay uh, not, to, not to argue for comparable worth, but instead to legitimate affirmative action attacking the gender division of labor rather than emphasizing the inherent value of female-typed work. Further, feminists in the multi-issue National Organization for Women endured a bitter internal struggle over whether sex equality laws like Title VII promised upward mobility for women as individuals or offered the potential for more systemic class-based change. Thus, while feminists in the 1970s were deeply invested in issues of workplace rights and saw workplace rights issues as uh, a bedrock principle of their movement, the comparable worth issue was at best peripheral, peripheral to their workplace rights efforts. Even as workplace-focused feminists sparred over legal strategy while mostly sidestepping comparable worth, public sector labor activists increasingly saw comparable worth as a critical issue. In the 1970s, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, or AFSCME, uh, the nation's largest public sector union and an AFL-CIO affiliate, intensified its campaign for comparable worth. And by the end of the decade, it was the centerpiece of the union's sex-based activism. Contemporary changes in AFSCME's membership helped to explain this development. The Kennedy and Johnson administrations built new agencies that swelled the federal workforce. In 1971, 13 million American civilians worked for the government, uh, and this was an increase of 4 million workers since 1961, so a huge increase in federal employees. Uh, public workers' rights also expanded at the state level, as 37 states legalized collective bargaining for government workers between 1959 and 1980. As a result of these changes, AFSCME membership surpassed 1 million by 1980. Uh, the organization also became increasingly feminized in these same years. In 1980, AFSCME represented 400,000 women and 200,000 clericals, 80% of whom were women. So most AFSCME locals by this time had women's rights committees charged with addressing the specific problems identified by women's workers. And some of these problems included equal pay, uh, job training for workers returning to the workforce after taking time off to be with families, uh, and job safety. Women's prominence in the union also meant that AFSCME contracts typically required employers to provide on-site or subsidized childcare and to get tougher on sexual harassment in those workplaces. AFSCME leaders began to explore the comparable worth theory after the Narrow Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963. Yet the union only began sustained comparable worth activism a decade later when, in 1973, the Washington State branch of AFSCME publicly accused Washington State Governor Daniel Evans of perpetuating wage discrimination in state employment. Regardless of state leaders' intent, AFSCME officials argued, the state should be financially liable for paying unequal wages to male and female-dominated jobs that yielded equal value to the state. Washington's governor investigated AFSCME's accusations, noting that no wage study of this type or magnitude had ever been conducted in the public sector, uh, looking at where men and women were working across the state and what kinds of wages they were getting. The governor's staff devised a rough system by which to compare <coughs> substantively different jobs based on their required training, expertise, and skill. They concluded that male-dominated jobs were paid approximately $100 more per week than comparable female-dominated jobs. The governor reported this finding, but took no steps to correct the disparity. As a result, AFSCME filed sex discrimination charges against the state of Washington in federal court in 1980. In building its case against the state of Washington, AFSCME's attorneys obtained class certification for the more than 10,000 female state employees who worked in occupations that were more than 70% female. At trial, AFSCME attorney Wynne Newman argued that the state of Washington had known for years that its pay policies were discriminatory and had chosen not to remedy these disparities. Among AFSCME's expert witnesses was former EEOC chair Eleanor Holmes Norton. She explained that sex-biased sex wage disparities kept skilled women in poverty, artificially depressing their wages simply because they were women. Uh, for example, she testified, under the state of Washington's wage system, quote, a maintenance man with no skills will make more than a skilled typist. 
1983, federal judge Jack Tanner ruled in favor of the union in AFSCME versus Washington. He ordered the state of Washington to immediately increase the wages of female employees based on the state's own data about who was working where and getting paid what. Lead attorney Wynne Newman likened the win to landmark civil rights decisions and predicted that comparable worth would enable women to make huge strides against discriminatory employers. He claimed, quote, this ruling will break the back of sex-based wage discrimination in this country. The case takes recognition of the fact that employers have deliberately segregated workers according to sex, paying one group at an inferior rate. It's really an extension of the Supreme Court's school desegregation decision, which said that separation of the races denoted the inferiority of one race. AFSCME leaders believed that their victory in Washington would generate a sea change in national sex discrimination policy and pay practices. So feminist groups uh, like the National Organization for Women and Working Women, the, umbre the umbrella group to which 9to5 belonged, joined AFSCME at this point in forming the National Coalition for Pay Equity, or NCPE, to expand the fight for comparable worth. Between 1980 and 1983, AFSCME filed and NCPE supported comparable worth wage discrimination charges against more than 10 cities, including Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, as well as the states of Hawaii, uh, of Hawaii and Wisconsin. Further, activists successfully pressured other state governments to undertake wage studies like Washington's, averaging wage rates for men and women and exposing the disparities between male and female dominated jobs. In the early 1980s, the comparable worth struggle began to force public sector employers to systematically reevaluate pink collar pay in the name of state enforced sex equality. Yet by mid decade, by the mid 1980s, comparable worth had really stalled. Uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the federal agency charged with interpreting and enforcing Title VII, wrestled with the concept for several years, sort of internally. Uh, but in 1985, EEOC Chairman Clarence Thomas announced his agency's decision that, quote, sole reliance on a comparison of the intrinsic value of dissimilar jobs, which command different wages in the market, does not prove a violation of Title VII. Thomas explained that comparable worth fell beyond the intended meaning of the law envisioned by Title VII's framers, which um, is a little bit humorous to those of us who know about the origin story of women's inclusion in Title VII, that there was actually no uh, original intent by most of those folks to include women at all. Uh, so as a result, EEOC stopped fielding comparable worth complaints. Further, that same year, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights declared comparable worth to be, quote, profoundly and irretrievably flawed. Private employers remained staunchly opposed to comparable worth, and even earlier gains began to slip away. In 1985, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the finding in, AF in AFSCME versus State of Washington, rejecting comparable worth as the grounds for a Title VII sex discrimination complaint. And in the end, uh, the comparable worth movement of the 1970s and 1980s yielded revised pay practices in a few state and local governments, but this outcome fell far short of activi activist expectations of a dramatic sea change in what we understood uh, sex discrimination and employment to look like. So um, I just have a few uh, minutes left, uh, but I'll say that um, in sort of summary, the, compar the comparable worth movement complicates scholars' conceptions of activist efforts to understand and manipulate the new sex equality laws of the 1960s. Comparable worth was peripheral to feminist agenda in the late 1960s and 1970s as they advocated for working women's rights despite its earlier support uh, in the earlier 60s among powerful feminists and government officials. In these same years, the public sector union AFSCME saw comparable worth as a way to help its increasingly female membership, but their campaign did not yield tangible legal victories until the early 1980s. And by then, comparable worth had many fewer allies in the federal government. And the feminist movement was not the grassroots powerhouse by this point that it had been a decade and a decade and a half earlier. So in moving away from comparable worth, workplace advocates ended the last widespread attempt to improve pay and working conditions for women that challenged the unregulated market as sexist in and of itself, uh, and sought to raise women's pay by reference to the inherent value of feminized work. 
feminists had always targeted the bifurcated system of employment that reserved elite and well-compensated jobs for men and confined women to a subordinate, low-paid job ghetto. But the weakening of comparable worth efforts in some ways affirmed this two-track system. As professional women have increasingly entered male-dominated areas of the, of the workforce, sort of um, gaining entry in some ways to this more elite track of jobs, working class women have only remained clustered in low paying jobs whose value continues to gain. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next we'll hear from Deborah Dinner, who is assistant professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, professor Dinner earned, earned her BA, JD, and PhD from Yale University and has held legal history fellowships at uh, Harvard and NYU. She has written extensively about the legal history of feminist activism, analyzing evolving understandings of sex equality, reproductive liberty, and distributive justice. She's published articles uh, in several publications, including the Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review, the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism, and Law and History Review. She also has a fascinating current book project analyzing how feminists, business groups, and new right activists transformed the legal regulation of reproductive labor in the late 20th century. I guess more directly towards you. <laughs> So in the spring of 1967, Assistant Secretary of Labor Esther Peterson remarked with impatience on the slow pace of change. And she was talking here about the fate of protective labor standards in a new era of sex equality or nascent sex equality heralded by the passage of Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which was the provision that uh, prohibited sex discrimination in employment. So Peterson lamented that only a handful of states had extended sex-specific protective labor standards and specifically maximum hours laws from women to men. Uh, so my talk here is drawing on a book manuscript in prog progress titled Contested Labor, Production and Reproduction in the Age of Market Conservatism, 1964 to 2010. And today's talk draws on one of the um, more important themes of the book, and that is uh, labor feminist vision for both equal employment opportunity and affirmative workers' rights to safe, healthy, and humane workplaces. And in my work on labor feminism, I'm building on the work of historians such as Dorothy Sue Cobble and Dennis Deslip, who've looked at the activism of women in labor unions. Um, and my story kind of picks up where theirs end at the moment of women's liberation. <clears throat> So I argue that the labor feminist vision included both a commitment to um, eliminating sex role stereotypes under law or anti-stereotyping and to distributive justice. Uh, but business groups and market conservative pol political uh, allies um, defeated labor feminists' most robust claims to a more humane workplace. So as a result, feminists made significant advances um, although, as we know, it's still a continued struggle, but more advances towards equal employment opportunity um, defined as um, kind of individual merit in the workplace, um, but less advances towards using anti-discrimination law to universalize labor protective standards um, and to catalyze a more transformed, humane workplace. So in my talk today, I'll focus on two historical episodes to illustrate my argument. And the first is the debate over the fate of sex-specific protective labor standards in the late 60s and at the decade's turn, um, and specifically maximum hours laws. And then the second is the debate about fetal protection policies that begin in the mid-1970s and then extend to the early 1990s. So the story of maximum hours laws began um, where I began my talk today, with Esther Peterson giving a speech in 1967. So just three years earlier, as vice chair of the President's Commission on the Status of Women, Esther Pearson had re favored retaining sex-specific protective labor standards. Until that time, 
at which um, these laws could be extended through state legislative campaigns. And specifically, um, she had recommended on the PCSW the extension of overtime laws on the state level that would protect workers from working longer than a 40-hour work week, and that would give them premium pay for overtime work. So just three years later, um, in 1967, Peterson was far less sanguine. So the lack of progress in achieving state overtime laws um, made her kind of change her definition about that timing or her calculus about kind of the timing of change and now began to argue that, we, no, we should eliminate sex-specific protective labor standards and reveal them as sex discriminatory. Um, so she told her audience in 1967, quote, at this point in history, we cannot and should not insist on maintaining the maximum hours laws until premium pay for overtime is achieved. Um, so this dilemma of timing um, it split the labor feminist movement, and it implicated questions about feminist priorities, about gender ideologies, and for the historian, it shows historical contingency in the way uh, the operation of the state, and specifically the relationship between state legislatures, state administrative agencies, and federal courts um, limited the institutionalization of the labor feminist vision. So the dilemma, as many of you know, split labor feminists into, into two camps, and some feminists um, made the kind of long-standing arguments that had existed since the progressive era about the need to retain sex-specific protective labor standards. So they had universal standards as an ideal, but they said no matter what happens to the universal effort, um, we need to retain uh, labor standards for women at the state level. But other labor feminists challenged sex-specific protective labor laws, even as they fought to universalize these standards. And as others have shown, the UAW had a particularly strong tradition of women's rights activism. And also, the auto industry was an industry where the jobs were more sex-integrated, so protective labor laws posed a peculiar obstacle um, to women's employment opportunity. So in the fall of 1967, Carolyn Davis, who was the head of the UAW's um, Women's Bureau spearheaded a campaign to repeal a maximum hours law in Michigan. And she was successful, and her co-unionists cheered her on. But others within labor feminism uh, reacted to this repeal of the maximum hours law for, for women with far greater hostility. So specifically, Myra Wolfgang, um, a leader in the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union, um, accused Davis and the UAW of colluding with the Chamber of Commerce and with business and professional women's clubs, and she alleged, quote, a secret move to force women in Michigan back to the days of the sweatshop. So Wolfgang, along with Mary Dublin Kieserling, who was the head of the Women's Bureau of the Department of Labor, campaigned to reinstate a maximum hours law. So the fate of what would happen to a um, sex specific maximum hours law under Title VII, that specific legal question, kind of bounced around in Michigan from the state legislature to a state administrative agency to the state courts, and then finally rested with the state attorney general. And the attorney general found that a sex specific maximum hours law violated Title VII. But Carolyn Davis, um, the leader of the UAW Women's uh, Bureau, um, didn't rest content just with this anti-discrimination victory. So after the repeal, um, she went and started campaigning for a maximum hours law that was sex neutral and for an overtime pay law. So Davis and other labor feminists updated the kind of maternalist arguments about the need to protect motherhood um, about a half century old. Um, which feminists had used in the progressive era to drive a wedge through Lochnerism, through conceptions of substantive due process and freedom of contract. But so they updated this, and rather than arguing that mothers who worked specifically needed protection, they began to argue that all workers required hours laws to fulfill roles as family members and as citizens. So UAW activist Dorothy Hainer explained, quote, Workers who are tied to factories day and night for hours and weeks on end do not have enough leisure time to be with their families for living and relaxing, let alone adequate time to give consideration to public issues. But Davis's and the UAW's universal maximum hours proposal never made it into law. And I'm still researching the opposition, which is kind of hard to get at the state level. But my strong hypothesis here is that the auto industry um, 
lobby defeated the bill in the state legislature. And so the unhappy fate of this maximum hours proposal kind of illustrates the difficulty, profound difficulty, feminists had politically in transforming a maternalist notion of protection into a more social democratic notion of distributive justice for all workers. Um, so in an era when the concept neoliberal principles of free market um, were gaining hegemony, um, the masculinist conception of an individual worker freely contracting, freely negotiating in the marketplace replaced a maternalist conception of labor protection. But in that transition, um, business and market groups successfully defeated labor feminists' more robust vision to use the anti-discrimination laws as a trigger point or a, me a mechanism to extend um, rather than to cut back on um, New Deal era progressive labor regulation. So this same kind of dynamic repeated about a decade later in the um, debate about fetal protection policies. So fetal protection policies um, took different forms, but the most common was an exclusionary ban on women working in specific workplaces where um, they faced reproductive hazards. Um, and they did it as far back as 1952 when General Motors first banned women workers from working in a battery plant in Indiana. But they proliferated in the mid-1970s along with a rise in scientific evidence about um, reproductive health and, and fetal hazards. And such policies, you can understand them from the employer's point of view. They came from a real, very real legal dilemma that employers faced about potential legal liability um, for future children who were born with congenital abnormalities um, because of their exposure to, to chemical hazards, either in utero or through their parents' parents' exposure. Um, so legal scholars, including Cynthia Daniels and S Suzanne um, Utaro Samuels, have analyzed this from a more theoretical point of view, the conflict between field rights and women's rights. Um, but nobody's really looked at the labor feminist um, history of activism and thought around these um, uh, policies, and that's kind of where my research in one of my chapters is focusing on. So I focus on the response by the Coalition of Labor Union Women, or CLU, which was founded in 1974 to advance women's rights within unions and to use unions as a tool to achieve sex equality. Um, and CLU's stance on fetal protection policies exemplified this labor feminist commitment that I've been talking about to both equal employment opportunity and enhanced labor regulation. So on one hand, Clue argued that these policies were just plainly sex discriminatory. They were overbroad. Um, they excluded all women from workplaces, whereas only a smaller percentage of women would actually get pregnant. Um, they perpetuated the notion that women were secondary workers and perpetual childbearers. And they were mostly implemented in um, labor market sectors where women were new entrants. Um, so they played into male hostility to job competition that was coming from women and entrenched sex segregation in the labor market. But at the same time, uh, Clue made another argument, which was that fetal protection policies let companies off the hook for cleaning up their workplaces. So by locating the socio-legal socio problem in women's bodies rather than in corporate practices, um, fetal protection policies allowed companies to evade implementing health and safety measures that would clean up the workplace for all workers. So it was cheaper just to exclude women than to really um, do the hard work of cleaning up the workplace. So Clue argued that these fetal protection policies protected against direct fetal exposure, exposure in utero um, for pregnant women, but didn't uh, protect against the hazards to the male reproductive system. So they highlighted um, a broader scientific evidence that, quote, a damaged fetus may result from a damaged sperm as well as a damaged egg. So Clue argued not only for anti-discrimination law, but also for enhanced job rights and regulatory protections that would improve reproductive health for men and women. Um, and they argued that striking down these exclusionary fetal protection policies alone, that just doing that would be a pure vi victory. So such victory would not involve, quote, a real commitment by industry to clean up the factory. Um, so once again, labor feminists were campaigning for both the elimination of sex role stereotypes under law and for a broader um, definition of affirmative worker rights and regulatory standards. 
But the labor feminists only ended up getting half this vision. So in the Reagan era, in the 1980s, um, uh, Reagan policies weakened the Occupational Health and Safety Commission, and both OSHA and the EPA failed um, to robustly regulate reproductive health in the workplace. And then after a period of confusion in the lower federal courts, the US Supreme Court in 1991, in the case of UAW versus Johnson Controls, quite correctly struck down exclusionary fetal prote protection policies as unlawful under Title VII. But Johnson Controls was only half a victory. Um, so labor feminists in this decision advanced the anti-discrimination paradigm, but an earlier vision they had for affirmative workplace rights to a healthy workplace um, did not, was not ad advanced by this decision and languished in administrative paralysis. So just in conclusion, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where I think this research um, that draws on two different chapters in my book project um, kind of brings us in the historiography. Um, first, I think it helps us rethink um, the role of gender ideologies, both in feminism and anti-feminism. So it shows the centrality of a vision of workplace justice for men as well as women in labor feminist vision. Um, and it shows also the, the role that masculinist ideologies uh, um, played in foreclosing the ability to transform earlier 20th century arguments about maternalist protection into broader sex neutral universal social democratic arguments. Um, and second, I think um, this research highlights the significance of business groups in opposition to feminism. So often we think about the story of feminism and anti-feminism as feminists campaigning for the transformation of gender roles and social conservatives defending traditional gender roles. Um, but if you focus on labor feminist distributive justice claims about the workplace, then the most significant opposition um, that comes to the forefront is that of business groups under, um, against a more transformed workplace. Um, and then third, my talk um, highlights the importance of paying attention to the, to the liberal state and to the interaction between courts and legislatures um, in understanding the contingency involved in the institutionalization or lack thereof of different feminist visions. Um, so I argue that the anti-discrimination paradigm of the late civil rights era came to eclipse rather than to complement the New Deal era protective labor paradigm, and that the loss of a labor feminist vision that synthesized commitments to anti-stereotyping with commitments to enhanced labor regulation um, has long-standing implications both for our ability to achieve sex equality and also, um, as Catherine mentioned, for deepening class inequities amongst women. Hear from Mary Ziegler, who is assistant professor of law at Florida State University. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Law School, um, and she uses legal history to probe assumptions underlying current debates about constitutional, reproductive health, and family law issues. She is already the author of more than a dozen law review articles, and her book, uh, which is another fantastic project, um, is entitled The Lost History of the Abortion Debate. Uh, it's about the debate over abortion in the decade after Roe versus Wade, and it's, it's going to be a path-breaking book, and it is, she has just told me, uh, going to be published, hopefully, by Harvard University Press in the spring of 2015, so please look out for that as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, I think we're all talking about uh, distributive justice, and my paper deals with that in the context of reproductive choice. So conventionally, we think of choice as being a kind of problematic paradigm for feminists and for women, even who don't consider themselves to be feminists for a number of reasons. And we think that Roe v. Wade kind of saddled feminists with a limited and limiting idea of choice. Why was choice a limiting idea? It denied the importance of distributive justice for women. It suggested that reproductive liberty was simply a freedom from the state, and that there were no women who actually needed affirmative support from the state in order to make reproductive decisions. And it reinforced, as Ricky Solinger and others have argued, the idea that some women made good choices and others went while other women didn't, which I think strengthened existing race and class divisions governing reproductive health care. 
So by spotlighting, I think, an understudied debate about reproductive liberty norms in the workplace, I want to argue that, there, that choice arguments had lost potential, potential that was evident in the 70s and some of men went missing in the 1980s. So in, uh, immediately before and after the decision of Roe v. Wade in the 70s, and Debbie and others have written about this, feminists developed what I'm going to call a principle of meaningful choice. So the idea was that women's choices weren't really meaningful or didn't really live up to constitutional standards unless one or two things were true. The more modest claim was that the state couldn't constitutionally fund one reproductive decision like childbirth while refusing to fund another like abortion. More ambitiously, feminists argued that the state actually had an affirmative obligation to fund certain constitutional rights, including reproductive liberty, that if choice was to have any meaning, women would actually have to have the financial means to effectuate their decision, including access to things like contraception, child care, and a living wage. So conventionally, historians argue that this vision more or less faded away in the late 70s with a series of Supreme Court decisions on things like pregnancy, disability, and abortion funding. But I'm going to argue that these decisions didn't defeat the idea of meaningful reproductive liberty any far from it. In fact, the idea reappeared and flourished in Congress and bizarrely won the support of an influential group of anti-abortion women. So my paper is going to explore why this happened and what we can learn about both what the Pregnancy Discrimination Act probably means, why the idea of meaningful reproductive choice lost favor, and what we can learn from that experience about women's liberation, both past and present. So first I'm going to talk briefly about the legislative constitutional project pursued by feminists and anti-abortion activists, and I'm going to focus on why anti-abortion activists who were, after all, you know, anti-choice, right, that's what a lot of us actually call them, embraced this idea of reproductive choice in the 70s, which is a, a strange puzzle. Next I'm going to explore why the idea of meaningful reproductive liberty lost influence in the later 70s, and I'm going to conclude with what implications I think this might have for the history and future of the women's movement. So conventionally, we think that the idea of meaningful reproductive liberty more or less died with a series of fairly famous and, I guess, ignominious Supreme Court decisions, beginning with Godolding versus Aiello in 1974, in which the Supreme Court wisely held that pregnancy discrimination was not sex discrimination because, after all, many men do and are can get pregnant. Uh, followed that up in 1976 with General Electric versus Gilbert, which held that us uh, Pregnancy discrimination didn't violate Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act either. The court was equally unreceptive to the idea of meaningful reproductive liberty in the context of abortion funding, holding that bans on either state or federal funding for abortion didn't violate any kind of concept of reproductive liberty, because at most, a right to have an abortion or use contraception gave women freedom from the state, and if women were poor, that was not the fault of the state or the employer or much of anyone else. Interestingly, though, Gilbert in particular infuriated a broad group of women, including abortion opponents. So I want to trace why anti-abortion activists embraced this idea of reproductive liberty. This is in some ways a story about how the anti-abortion movement tried to ground its ideas about the fetus in existing constitutional doctrine. Because as early as the 1960s, abortion opponents realized that feminists were quite convincingly arguing that the Constitution required access to abortion. And rather than simply defending a legal or moral status quo, anti-abortion activists had to explain why they had a constitutional leg to stand on. Somewhat ironically, they turned to what many of us see as progressive or even feminist constitutional doctrine, particularly the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause. The Due Process Clause was helpful, of course, because it allowed anti-abortion activists to argue that the Constitution recognized rights not spelled out in its text. They wanted to argue that the right to life, which was, of course, their claim of choice, was protected by the Constitution, notwithstanding its absence in either the text or history of that document. The Equal Protection Clause played a more interesting role. So, for example, activist Robert Byrne, who led anti-abortion activities in New York State, argued that the unborn child, or the fetus, shared every salient trait with racial minorities, and he noted women. The common denominator in Byrne's view was that all of these groups were vulnerable and dependent. He argued, quote, uh, the more helpless and dependent a person is, the more solicitous the law and the Constitution is of his welfare. What Byrne and others were claiming to do was supposedly consistent with existing constitutional doctrine, but in reality, it was a radical reconceptualization of it. Conventionally, lawyers look 
among other things, and the Supreme Court did as well, at whether an individual had an immutable trait, like race or sex, that they couldn't change in deciding whether they should be entitled to special constitutional protection under the Equal Protection Clause. Activists like Byrne rejected this and argued that simple powerlessness or vulnerability was enough to justify judicial scrutiny. Byrne and others recognized that this extension would embolden other groups to demand constitutional protection as well, particularly the poor and the disabled who are arguably vulnerable in just the same way. Roe v. Wade did nothing to dissuade anti-abortion activists from pursuing this constitutional vision. And if you look at the constitutional amendments they proposed to overrule Roe v. Wade, many of them contain just the equal protection language I've described to you. However, the Roe decision revealed a kind of interesting fight within the anti-abortion movement about who counted as vulnerable, dependent, or helpless. Many pro-lifers argued that it was better to just focus on the fetus, either because they didn't care about anybody with the fetus, or because, for strategic reasons, they wanted to focus on the one thing on which they all agreed. Others, who were generally considered themselves Democrats or social justice activists, saw women as a key example of vulnerable and dependent persons, particularly pregnant women. Over the course of the mid-1970s, they elaborated on why this is the case, and I want to focus on one particular anti-abortion activist whose name was Marjorie Mecklenburg. She was an interesting woman. Uh, she considered herself a helpmate to a much more influential husband, who was in fact an OBGYN and a leader of Planned Parenthood in Minnesota. Mecklenburg considered herself a Democrat. She supported the Equal Rights Amendment. She voted for Democrats. Uh, she didn't consider herself to be a liberated woman because she saw herself as her husband's helpmate. But in the pro-life movement, she took a leading role, eventually eclipsed her husband both in the amount of money she made and the amount of political influence she achieved. So her journey was an ironic one. Uh, Mecklenburg began to elaborate on her idea of reproductive liberty in supporting an amendment banning abortion. She said that women were vulnerable in, in an equal protection clause sense because the state denied them meaningful reproductive liberty. Not abortion, but what she saw as the real reproductive liberty. Why was that? She said, women are making choices about whether to give their child the right to life based on economic conditions. If they feel pressured because of an economic situation, we can ask what kind of choice they have. Mecklenburg popularized these ideas in the movement and her and her colleagues lobbied for, state, for laws at both the state and federal level, among other things, allowing women to claim unborn children as dependents for the purpose of social security, uh, banning discrimination against unwed mothers in education or in the workplace, not just women, but she wanted unwed mothers in particular, uh, laws prohibiting hospitals from putting the word illegitimate on birth certificates, and significantly pregnancy discrimination legislation, which she cared about not because of sex stereotyping, she, in fact, embraced sex stereotypes, but because it represented, in her mind, a denial of reproductive liberty. More transparently, pro-lifers supported pregnancy discrimination legislation because they believed that women would have fewer abortions if they didn't face discrimination at work or didn't have to worry about losing their jobs. But Mecklenburg also saw it, and many of her colleagues did as well, as a guarantee of meaningful reproductive choice. That was choice with some kind of reproductive justice component. As she explained, quote, many poor women presently have only the freedom to abort. Alternatives to abortion and equality in the workplace must be real if freedom of conscience and responsibility are to be more than rhetoric. This means that society must offer good health care, a living wage, both pre- and postnatal daycare facilities, and maternity and paternity leave. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act debate then created odd alliances between people like Mecklenburg and feminists like Wendy Williams. Uh, it created common ground between Catholic churches that often had nothing to do with the National Coalition of Churches, which was rather left-leaning, and it won the support of a number of members of Congress who often had very little interest in reproductive liberty at all, especially when poor women were involved. So I want to th then ask my second question, which is why did these arguments, which had gained so much currency, fade away in the early 1980s? I think these arguments lost support, not because of any of the flaws that feminist commentators, I think, have correctly identified, but rather because of a rapidly changing political reality. First, as the battle about Medicaid funding and abortion intensified, it became difficult, and there was, in fact, internal pressure on people like Mecklenburg to abandon arguments that stood in obvious tension with claims about Medicaid-funded abortion. Henry Hyde is internal documents, and I've interviewed people who knew him, 
recognize that one of the best arguments for the Hyde Amendment and bans on Medicaid-funded abortion was that it was, un that it was constitutional. They were claiming this is actually permitted under Roe v. Wade. And for that to be true, the right recognized by Roe v. Wade had to at most guarantee women freedom from state interference. Hyde and his allies increasingly pressured left-leaning pro-lifers to not say anything that conflicted with their claims about Roe v. Wade in any context, particularly in the later 70s, as year after year saw intense battles about the scope of exceptions to Medicaid funding for rape, incest, and the health of the mother. More importantly, political party realignment and the mobilization of the religious right and new right created powerful new financial and political incentives for even instinctively left-leaning anti-abortion activists to side with the political right. In the late 1970s, the anti-abortion movement was badly financially strapped and politically isolated. And then the new right and religious right with organizations like the Moral Majority and Christian Voice offered them financial stability and a pathway to political influence. To give you a sense, the National Right to Life Committee, which was the biggest anti-abortion organization, was about $25,000 in debt in 1978. And at about exactly the same time, the moral majority was raising more than $1 million a month in direct mail contributions. Uh, at the same time, this was the, the period in which the Republican Party platform for the first time endorsed a fetal protective amendment to the Constitution, making clear that the path to political relevance for anti-abortion activists lay with an alliance with the Republican Party and the right. The arguments that people like Mecklenburg had made no longer fit in the new agenda crafted by the anti-abortion movement and its allies. Whereas people like Robert Byrne and Marjorie Mecklenburg had argued that dependency entitled unborn children and women alike to the solicitude of the state, Ronald Reagan argued that dependency was dangerous and a source of deviance and self-destructiveness. The new right and the religious right, along with Reagan, also opposed anti-discrimination law more broadly, including the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, particularly when that law could be framed as a form of special treatment for vulnerable groups, just the type of argument that Mecklenburg had made. At the same time, feminists began to move away from choice arguments, identifying many of the flaws the commentators have so effectively displayed. By the mid-1980s, it had already become something of a cottage industry for legal academics to attack the constitutional underpinnings of Roe v. Wade. And by the mid-1980s, feminists had responded powerfully, explaining that the problem with Roe was not that it recognized an abortion right, but rather that it had a not very persuasive constitutional rationale for doing so. So as feminists began identifying better explanations of the result reached in Roe, they lost sight of the transformative arguments about choice that had attracted the attention of both feminists and anti-abortion activists in the 70s. So I want to close by thinking about what this might mean for people now as we think both about the history of the movement for women's liberation and the future of it. Uh, I think first these claims suggest that um, we might be better off in advancing reproductive liberty and looking outside of the courts. The courts have historically been terrible at this, and they were then. Um, Congress was quite receptive, and state legislatures now are proving more receptive to um, the idea that women might require accommodation while pregnant, not simply formal equal treatment. I think this also suggests that the interpretation of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that most courts embrace is probably wrong. It's quite common now for courts to, to endorse what's called pregnancy-blind policies. That is to say, a policy that allows women formal equal treatment but allows employers to deny women's request for a modification or light work while pregnant so long as their policies don't formally discriminate on the basis of pregnancy. I think the history of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act suggests that that result would disturb both conservatives and progressives, both anti-abortion women and feminists. Finally, I think this history reveals the potential of arguments for reproductive choice that we might have lost. Choice arguments did a lot of amazing things in the 70s. They created a limited form of common ground for women who disagreed passionately about abortion. They allowed both politicians and grassroots activists across the political spectrum to actually recognize the importance of reproductive liberty for women and about distributive justice. This was quite remarkable for Congress. Uh, and finally, I think they exposed how diverse women, both on both sides of the abortion issue, could be. Uh, I've interviewed many of these women for the book, over 100 of them. Uh, and I, I saw, I talked to many people. I talked to homemakers and doctors lawyers, conservatives, liberals, women for or against abortion, and they were many things, but all of them defied easy categorization.
so much for these wonderfully rich and fascinating papers. I was struck as I was re reading them, I got um, the great good fortune to be able to read them before the panel, um, by how much these projects are in conversation with one another, um, which makes my task as a commentator even more of a pleasure. Moreover, I think these papers really challenge and complicate the binaries that often characterize accounts of feminist advocacy that are less sophisticated than the ones that you've just heard. So when it comes to feminist encounters with the law, particularly in the 1970s, we often hear advocates and their theories described in terms of dichotomous alternatives, formal versus substantive equality, sameness versus difference, liberal versus radical, negative versus positive rights, liberty versus community, anti-stereotyping versus distributive justice, assimilationist versus separatist. Sex equality law, uh, what emerged from the advocacy of the 1960s and 70s, almost always falls, I think, on the boring side of these binaries. The sex equality res revolution was the kind of revolution that was more circular than transformative, shoring up capitalism, privatized dependency, racial and class stratification, patriarchal norms, and heteronormativity. Or so the story goes. Recent work in this area, including the projects that we've heard about today, tells a much more complicated and interesting story. As each of these panelists has demonstrated, feminists of various stripes demanded much more than formal equality, assimilation to a male norm, or the right to be left alone by the government. They fought for an affirmative right to reproductive health services, subsidized not, and not merely tolerated by the state. They insisted that reproductive choices be truly voluntary and meaningful and that women, and notably men, should not be forced to choose between childbearing and gainful employment, between their families and their economic fortunes, between their family dependence and economic independence. They combated the devaluation of feminized labor by demanding equal pay for comparable work, by shining a spotlight on the dangerous conditions that characterize women's paid, unpaid, and underpaid work, and demanding government protection for all workers from hazards that threaten their lives and livelihoods. Feminists themselves, I think these papers also demonstrate, saw through the false choices they confronted, choices between equality and protection from harm, autonomy and collective action, dependence and dignity. But as they discovered, if they didn't already know, concepts such as choice, vulnerability, protection, and even equality prove double-edged. Framing women as vulnerable mothers in need of protection from workplace exploitation, of course, ran the risk of promoting paternalistic caricatures of women as primarily mothers and wives rather than workers at best, at worst as weak, needy, and unworthy of full citizenship or truly equal employment opportunity. Even the comparable worth movement arguably risked reifying or at least accepting occupational segregation. The idea of meaningful choice could be turned against feminists by employers arguing that the decriminalization of abortion and birth control made pregnancy a voluntary condition, um, as Debbie's earlier work has shown, absolving business and society of all responsibility for supporting their choice. Choice. Uh, Judge Robert Bork, um, as, uh, as Debbie's written paper reveals, went so far as to characterize women forced to undergo sterilization or lose their jobs as choosing to sacrifice their fertility, relieving employers and the government of any obligation to ensure safe working conditions for women or men. You want equality? We'll give you equality. The equal right to expose yourself to uncompensated devastating risks, the equal right to no parental or disability leave, the equal right to work long hours and forego any semblance of family life. Each and every one of these equal rights, of course, arguably affected most women, given their greater material investment in family life and accompanying social expectations, more profoundly than men. One problem, as many feminists recognized, was that equality based on a male model of the independent family wage earning worker with a wife assuming all family care burdens hardly resembled equality at all. Another problem, as these papers all underscore, was that absent any national commitment to redistributive justice, any appetite for greater state and social supports for workers and families, and with unions on the wane, working class and middle class men hardly had it good. <clears throat> Persistent ideologies of masculinity, not just femininity, shored up not only gender divisions of labor, but more generally an ethos of individualism that denigrated state support as dependency on government. These papers also 
in fascinating ways, question conventional wisdom about the presumptive enemies of feminism, business conservatives, social conservatives, and anti-abortion activists. Anti-feminist gender traditionalism, and moreover, fiscal conservatism, came late to many in the pro-life movement, Mary's paper shows us. And it was business conservatives, not social conservatives, who appear as the primary villains in Debbie's and Katie's accounts. Ultimately willing to accede to, and even embrace in some instances, the principle of formal equality, the business lobby ensured that anti-discrimination law would not entail the more capacious version of substantive equality or the unseating of gender ideologies that ascribed lesser value to women's paid and unpaid work and posited ideal workers as productive, presumptively male breadwinners unencumbered by reproductive or caregiving responsibilities and, importantly, independent of state support. Whereas feminists and social conservatives briefly found common ground in Mary's story, it was ultimately a compromise between feminism and economic conservatism that became embedded in employment discrimination law. As Debbie has shown here and in other work, feminists even found themselves arguing for employment discrimination law as a bulwark against expanding welfare rules. Okay, so in the short run, none of these stories ended especially well for feminists. <laughs> Promising collaborations between feminists and social conservatives fizzled, extinguished by a growing alliance between the anti-abortion movement and the new right. Arguments about meaningful choice receded as a defense of abortion funding restrictions required advocates to eschew reproductive freedom as a positive liberty and deny public obligations to provide access to reproductive health services. Courts interpreted the Pregnancy Discrimination Act narrowly, allowing employers to treat pregnant workers poorly so long as they denied accommodations to everyone else. Equal pay for comparable work never caught on, and indeed equal pay for equal work is a principle enforced mostly in the breach. Feminists finally won gender neutral leave legislation, but the Family and Medical Leave Act left 40% of the US workforce uncovered and offered nothing to women and men who can't afford to take unpaid leave. But the title of this panel is The Unfinished Business of Sex Equality. And if the 1980s is the short run, then we're still living in the long run. And so I thought I would take off my historian's hat for a moment um, and reflect on the implications of this history for the present and future moments. So Mary's paper concludes by suggesting legislation as the best hope for finishing the business of sex equality. Feminist advocates such as Wendy Webster Williams and Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a similar point in the early 1980s, realizing the limits of litigation that Mary alluded to and achieving affirmative as opposed to defensive goals. Indeed, as a Supreme Court Justice, Ginsburg has more than once called upon Congress to push back against judicial retrenchment, as she successfully did in her eloquent dissent in the Equal Pay Cap case, Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire, and as she has most recently done in a ruling restricting employer liability for sexual harassment. Many of the bright spots on the feminist horizon today are taking the form of legislation, much of it at the state or local rather than the federal level. The United States, as you all know, is virtually alone among developed and developing countries alike in offering workers no paid maternity leave. But slowly, some states are taking small steps toward paid family and medical leave guarantees. And despite some opposition from the business lobby, most employers seem to acknowledge that the sky has not yet fallen. Several states and localities, most recently New York City and Philadelphia, as Mary alluded to, have passed pregnancy accommodation laws that require employers to transfer pregnant workers to less strenuous positions or otherwise accommodate temporary conditions resulting from pregnancy. In addition to the more visible and controversial provisions of the Affordable Care Act um, uh, regarding contraceptive provision, the health care law also for the first time requires employers to provide a clean private space for nursing mothers to express breast milk at work. On the more aspirational side of things, feminists have proposed fair pay legislation that would go beyond the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act's Band-Aid solution to, for example, require employers to avoid the kind of discretionary compensation schemes that led Walmart to pay its female employees dramatically less for the same work to raise or remove damage caps for equal pay claims and to require greater wage transparency. Legislation proposed by Eleanor Holmes Norton, who makes an appearance in Katie's paper, uh, even revives the comparable worth concept that she first promoted in the 1970s. Also on an aspirational note, federal fa paid family and medical leave legislation has been introduced in Congress. And of course, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, ENDA, 
which would ban discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, has majority support and has long had majority support from the public and awaits the political stars to align, i.e. the Democrats to regain control of Congress. <laughs> In an era when passing federal legislation of any kind has all been impossible, feminists and their allies have also successfully advanced more capacious interpretations of existing legislation, reinterpreting statutes long thought to be narrow guarantees of formal equality in ways that advance substantive justice. This effort takes place on multiple fronts, I think, in courts, in administrative agencies, other places in the executive branch, and in the court of public opinion. For example, after the Americans with Disabilities Act was amended in 2008 to expand the definition of disability and thereby extend reasonable accommodation requirements to cover more disabled employees, feminists began to argue that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act required pregnant workers to receive the same accommodations afforded to other workers with temporary impairments, which had been much more difficult under the unamended ADA. Pregnancy discrimination claims have increased tremendously over the past several years and boast a higher success rate than most other employment discrimination claims, although that's not saying very much. Um, as ENDA stalled in Congress, the bipartisan EEOC last year followed several federal courts in ruling that Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination, properly interpreted, applies directly to prohibit discrimination based on transgender identity. Um, and at least one member of the EEOC thinks that uh, it's possible to interpret Title VII in the same way with respect to sexual orientation discrimination. Perhaps I think the most pertinent promising example of legislative reinterpretation is the burgeoning field of family responsibilities discrimination. Led by advocates including Joan Williams uh, and many others, feminists have reinterpreted anti-discrimination laws to prohibit discrimination against workers with caregiving responsibilities. Like the 1970s feminist efforts Mary and Debbie uh, have uncovered, Williams and her allies have built some strategic coalitions with both business and social conservatives. Advocates love to quote this one conservative Republican businessman named Tim, Jim Johnson, who, quote, found that flexible hours and family-friendly policies can increase a company's profits and success. Traditional family values, they emphasize, are nothing but compatible with allowing the workers, all workers, ch a chance to care for their families while achieving financial independence. In 2007, during the Bush administration, no less, the EEOC issued guidance explaining how and why discrimination against workers with family responsibilities violates anti-discrimination laws. At the heart of the campaign against family responsibilities discrimination and for family-friendly workplaces, is an assault, I think, on the forces that stymie the efforts that Mary, Debbie, and Katie have described. For women and men to realize true equality at home and in the workplace, feminists argue, we must reconfigure the ideal worker on whom public policy is based to look more like a woman with responsibilities for family care and breadwinning. The universalist impulse that motivated feminists to seek gender-neutral workplace protections for men as well as women now prompts advocates to emphasize the importance of protecting caregiving men, as well as women, from discrimination and making it possible for men, as well as women, to take leave from work or demand flexible schedules without negative repercussions. As feminists continue to struggle against the assumption that the sole responsibility for the cost of reproduction and care lies with individuals and families. So there is unfinished business, to be sure. I'm going to end there and welcome your questions to our wonderful Mississippi. 
Um, the only thing I think that's helpful to know is that there's more, I think, the division within the anti-abortion movement about whether that's the way to go, in other words, sort of incremental attacks on access to abortion versus kind of going for the home run and the total ban is deeper than ever. Um, I don't think people no. on the feminist side do anything with that very often. I mean, it's even in the news, but uh, just from yeah. talking to people, it's, and it's a pretty intense division. So um, I think, and I think the other kind of area that like Serena was saying for doing something about it is making sure in states like that, that women who can't access abortion at least have other things that some anti-abortion people might support, like, you know, access to equal pay or something like that, just because I think that's an area where there's more, um, there's still, I mean, even in Congress, I know the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which is, would be accommodation legislation, is the, the chief sponsor of that is Casey, who's still anti-abortion. So there, there might be some room for progress there, even though, um, <coughs> I mean, it's, in, it's not particularly different or surprising that some of these states that are so anti-abortion and so red are banning access to abortion, but those seem to me to be promising avenues. So um, I'm Liz Schneider, and um, it's great to hear these pan the, the discussions uh, by all of you. But I have to say, Gabby, I had a particular connection to yours because I wrote one of the um, amicus briefs oh. in the Supreme Court for for Clue, mm -hmm. um, and well, not actually. Uh, I worked on the, the Johnson controls, but I was worked on the amicus brief in the um, in American Cyanamid. Mm -hmm. And that issue of um, right to a, to a safe and health, healthful workplace still, I think, has much untapped potential mm -hmm. um, as a way of grappling uh, with some of, with, with trying to, <coughs> to, in some sense, not divide the workplace. Now, of course, I understand that we are in a you know, completely different phase now. Congress, et cetera, but um, I, I still um, think that that's a really uh, important issue and something that um, really underlines um, both of the, the questions that you were talking about. I mean, both the penal responsibility, obviously, and maximum hours issues, et cetera. And, you know, when I started to become a lawyer, we were still talking about, you know, serious protective legislation. So that's just one comment that I would make, and I'm interested in hearing that. And then a second question that I have, which um, I've been uh, grappling with with my students in my Women in the Law classes, is um, why do you think that we've come uh, so, in such a very, very, um, you know, no progress at all, I would say, honestly, about reproductive rights, intensification of work, yeah. but um, we have been able to move in some ways around same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And what does it say? I mean, what, what does that say about abortion as ultimately, in some sense, a, form, a kind of hatred of women mm -hmm. in a way that takes a different form? I mean, there are all the obvious things of, you know, marriage is affirmative and blah, 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 and it's mm -hmm. formalization of same sex, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder if you, any of you have thought about that um, because um, I, I think it's a really complicated issue. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, as to your first comment, I just want to say thank you, and I'd, I'd love to talk with you more um, after the panel. Um, that's the wonderful thing about this conference and the, um, kind of different generations and backgrounds that it's bringing together um, for conversation. Um, I hadn't thought about uh, the issue of reproductive health work in the workplace as being um, maybe a point of potential alliance to build on um, between uh, the more social conservative and the feminist position. Um, and so thank you for that. I think it's one that we should all think about. I, one of the dynamics that I'm um, seeing in the historical research I'm doing is the way in which um, sometimes uh, kind of maternalist gender ideologies were able to circumvent um, business opposition um, and the ways in which that created a double-edged sword that Serena pointed out um, for feminists that it, it was a um, mechanism to achieve a more distributive justice aim 
um, but at the same time it reinforces gender roles. Um, I, I think the, the issue with the fetal protection policies um, is, is that the protection was so discriminatory in its effect on women's employment opportunity. But I think the fight for reproductive health is a, is a, is a is a one that might get a broader political um, a political agenda and force um, kind of the alliance of cons social and economic conservatism that Mary talks about um, in the Republican Party um, to kind of or at least to make that alliance very visible and maybe cre create a wedge to crack it on the abortion and same sex marriage issue. That is just so tough. I'm wondering if other others have um, something to say. About um, I mean, as, as you were asking your question, I mean, the first sort of um, thing that came to mind for me was class and thinking about how, um, so this, my paper was part of a, a larger book about Title VII that looks at sort of feminist strategies around workplace equality from the 60s until the 1990s. And part of what I argue is that as um, women start to win class action lawsuits, sort of win some of these legal victories, the concept of uh, state and forced sex equality as um, equal access for women to what men already have tends, comes to predominate. And broader questions women have been asking of Title VII in the 60s and earlier 70s about um, sort of redistributive, more redistributive policies, questions about you know, comparable worth in terms of refiguring sort of pay practices and um, employer practices that uh, involved more than just opening the door for women, keeping the, the hierarchy the same. And so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, gay, the gay marriage question I mean, required, it is about sort of access in some ways too, that it's sort of access to an institution, keeping the institution intact, but giving more people access. I think that's a different um, question than sort of more redistributive uh, promise that um, many feminists hoped that Title VII would have in the, in the early 60s. Yeah, and I mean, I think that in terms of did, did anti -abortion, do anti-abortion people all, are they all hostile to women? A lot of them are, and after the alliance with the new right, more of them were. Um, I can't tell you the number of people I talked to who were conservative on a lot of issues, but very liberal on redistributive issues. A lot of them dropped out of the movement. So there's a guy I know who is um, an Episcopal minister. And if you go on his Facebook page, it's all like moveon.org and like Obama and whatever. And he just quit the pro-life movement because at a certain point he just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so some of them are definitely, more of them than ever before, uh, embrace gender stereotypes. I think there's also a question with respect to same-sex marriage and abortion about visibility, because increasingly women who have abortions are not comfortable talking about it, they're silent, yeah. and the pro-life movement has always been very good at making the fetus visible, um, and sometimes in ways that are, I think, totally sincere. I mean, a lot of these people are very religious and they don't, they believe absolutely that this is, you know, indistinguishable from a child. And the feminist movement's not been that good at making, they make women visible, but not women who've actually had abortions, which is a different thing. Um, and the rhetoric is often, you know, like, the, it has been, I think, that some of the choice rhetoric in the 80s and 90s was about, you know, this is a measure of last resort, and we want to make abortion rare, and that sort of thing, which it only reinforced, I think, some of the culture of silence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Eileen Morris. Katie's uh, framing that the lost vision, if you want to use it, of comparable worth has real implications for the low wage, the valuing of <coughs> the sort of sector today, uh, reminds me of naming, of the questions of naming, and also the question of the arena of struggle. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring up uh, both of these. Uh, first, in terms of naming, what I've often thought, and I'm writing a book now on um, the International Labor Organization, using that as a way to talk about these kinds of questions. And the distinction between what we call protective legislation and labor standards. Now, for men, it's labor standards, but they're a form of protective laws. And some of them dealt with health and safety, et cetera. But when it came to the woman worker, there was both the same kind of, you might say, of, yes, they can have all these kinds of labor standards, but then there's the particular ones. And those often come up of what I would call cultures of protection uh, that embrace those stereotypes or gen certain gender ideologies or racialized 
uh, mobilizing a gender ideologies, class ideologies, as opposed to labor standards. So, from, so if we call it labor standards, then it is no longer protective, but it becomes something that comes out of the conditions of the environment in which you're having this fundamental right to work mm -hmm. as opposed to the other kind of right to work. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I think that's working when comparable work rather than uh, talking about the rate right for the job or some of the earlier language that was used in the 1940s uh, in, in that. Uh, the, the second is I was so struck by all of these papers about the, the difficulty or the, the limits and perhaps the negativity of the legal arena and also the legislative arena. Mm -hmm. So to be totally utopian in this moment, what can, given that we're talking about the women's liberation movement that was in the streets, that was creating alternative institutions, that was engaging in grassroots efforts and trying to change the hearts and minds through all mm -hmm. of the pamphlets that were circulating. When I think of what is to be done, and besides the um, Francis will do everything, um, <laughs> there is this notion that um, we this, the struggles on the ground, mm -hmm. and because that's the only way to change the legislatures and the courts. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I mean, Eileen, as I wrote the last few lines in my paper, I, of course, thought about your, uh, your care workers, your home health workers. And I think um, one of the uh, comparable worth advocates talked about the sort of folks who did this caring work for a wage. And why was this work so devalued? It's because it originates right. in the home where, you know, and, and why do teachers make so little? I mean, there's so right. much more and, and said about this the movement. the commodification of what is stereotypical. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and, it's, and it comes, you know, it's accompanied by love, and women are you know, naturally good at it, so it's not very valuable in those types of things. But um, I mean, you've written about healthcare workers organizing, home healthcare workers organizing, and it strikes me that this is the kind of thing that we need to be advocating more. This idea of workers sort of coming together for collective standards. Well, the courts are going to destroy oh, well, that. The courts will let them. <laughs> yeah. One thing that the conference I think raises um, for me is the question of. Um, how do we frame feminism and recapture it for, say, um, women a, a generation behind, say, where I am, so high school, young college um, students, and so maybe this question of naming um, <clears throat> and capturing a, a broader agenda um, that feminists had can help with that project, uh, because if we understand feminism as limited to just narrow individualist um, kind of uh, equality in the workplace, then the, some women who we may teach may think that it's no longer necessary, but mm -hmm. if we, we capture a broader agenda of what feminism um, did mean and, and then the ways that in, that in which that was limited, I think um, the need for further change becomes a little bit more visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think naming is important too. It's, it's striking if you talk to women, even in my generation, um, about whether they're feminists. Uh, and, and then when you line that up against their substantive commitments, because they are, they are feminists, they're just not calling themselves feminists. Right. So something has happened to even the meaning of feminism. Um, and so I think that's, in terms of not just explaining where we are and where we still need to go, but explaining what feminism is, because it seems that there's a tremendous amount of, I mean, it, it's, it's not surprising because it's complicated what feminism is, and feminists disagree about what feminist, right. feminism is, but right. it seems younger people know what feminism is and they don't like it, right? So that's bad. So we need to do something about that at a minimum by, you know, educating people about it. And, and so maybe part of that, um, that project, though, is trying to, t to start a bigger conversation about what's fair. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah. uh, I've been kind of this to teaching undergraduates who um, hold core bedrock feminist principles but would never call themselves for various reasons, and I guess you know that name is less important to me than the mm -hmm. ideas that it accompanies. But I think if you can um, open up a broader conversation about you know, sort of economic justice, social justice, fairness, that might be a way around some of the polarizing debates that um, have us stalemated in some way. Mm -hmm. As a young twenty-something, I completely agree with everything you just said. Thanks for being here. <laughs> <laughs> I have friends um, that I've spoken to, like you said, that share similar um, ideas about you know life in the world or whatever. Um, and I identify myself as a feminist, but when I ask them, they're like, "Oh no, 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 I'm not a feminist, but 
and they list off a lot of things. And I'm like, well, that's, I, I, we agree. So why do you say you're not a feminist? So I definitely agree that um, the naming, you know, has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think we may have time for one more question. I have a comment on, on what this conversation. What is, don't we need to get at the reason why they say they're not feminists? I mean, don't we need to try to I, I think out? I think part of it is that a lot of people see the word feminist as like a bad word. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to like militant feminists or like, you know, super radical. The ones that are like, you know, burn the rod, and mm -hmm. shoot their legs, or, you know, like that kind of. <laughs> That's seriously what it is, too. Yeah. Like, like everybody yeah. says burning your bra. Like if you ask people like, who's. Like it was your grandmother who burned her, if there was ever one burned, right? Yeah. Well, it wasn't, as a matter of fact, but anyway. <laughs> and I think that's, that had, like, the perception of what being a feminist is has been contorted and twisted into this, like, nasty thing. Yeah, and well, that's why people don't like to so identify who, who, who that. Who twisted it? Who contorted it? I don't know. Phyllis Schlafly's a good Queen Bono. Queen Bono. Queen Yeah, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is there's a fear that you can't be a feminist mm -hmm. and also be feminine. Right, yeah, that these yeah. are sort of mutually exclusive oh, identities. Yeah, or, or even, you know, for other people's rights, which I think goes mm -hmm. to something Katie said, because there are a yeah. lot of ways in which some, and Debbie's paper in all of our papers, there were, there were areas in which policies we identify as feminists would be helpful to everybody. I mean, to mm -hmm. men, to right. poor people, mm -hmm. to yeah. workers generally. And I think mm -hmm. that might be one way to kind of destigmatize feminism. Because feminism isn't, I think people think of it as like women above everybody else. Exactly. And that's never been what it was, and it's not what it is now either. Most definitely, like I, like a recent movement, like with the immigrant rights movement. I, I'm an immigration paralegal, so I also know about that. And there are a lot of um, women who are coming together and fighting for immigration reform. And I see that as another type of feminist movement mm -hmm. yeah. or a different goal, not necessarily just for women, but for like people, like a certain group in general, and try and mm -hmm. make things more fair, like you said. Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to remove the oppression. You know what? It, you know what's the what is the cause? Don't we? Need to think about what the cause of the oppression is. No, oh, sure. The sources for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is it? What is it in us as people such that uh, I don't think there's any kind of uh, a government to some say, oh, we have to get rid of capitalism, we need an anti capitalist government, we need a socialist government, we need a communist government, we need a social democracy, we just need that. The problem is in, is in us, it's in human behavior and what, um, how we're uh, raising our children. And, yeah, and and what's deep in our evolutionary, yes, I believe in it, uh, in our brains, you know, what what we brought along. I think we have to deal with that. These are, you know, more, I guess, psychiatric than. Um, Liz, you had your hand up, and I wanted to give you the last word if you want, and I um, no, hope we can continue no. the conversation after the panel. I'm, I'm as troubled as everyone else is about um, the resistance to the to the word feminism, and actually, I think probably in the next panel that's in this room, which is also related to law issues, we'll probably be talking about that. But I think that um, there are many different reasons for it. But one is um, there is a very strong sense in the culture that this is that that people have absorbed about feminism as a bad, angry thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't think that people who have the history of, that we are kind of celebrating in this conference are frankly all of us doing enough to counter that. Um, the initial impulses that led to an extraordinary movement of women in law was about naming and about identifying and about saying. Um, and just as we were mentioning that there isn't a lot of coming out in a sense about abortion partially because it's mostly impacting poor women and women of color mm -hmm. in terms of access, there's, a not, there's not enough action out there by, you know, statements, for example, of, you know, hundreds, thousands of women in this country 
had abortions and whatever, coming out and saying that. I mean, to leave, to leave the dialogue about women's equality, to lean in at this point is really a cop out on the parts of many of us who really deeply care about these issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think it's just, you know, our students think it's a bad thing. I mean, I think we have to really honestly take that on. I think we have to talk with them about that. I think we have to talk in general, in, you know, as public intellectuals, as scholars, as activists and whatever, and really address those issues very directly and very affirmatively. Because I, I really think we're losing um, many generations of younger potential allies and, um, and people who, you know, say, oh, I care about this, but, you know, my career guidance people told me not to put on my resume that I, you know, am a member of the Law Women's Association, or God forbid that I took women in the law, or God forbid that I do women's legal history, or whatever. These are real backlashes that we are grappling with, and I really think we've got to be much more affirmative in addressing Thank you, and we'll now yield the room to the next panel. I'm very much looking forward to <laughs> yes. um, everyone's contributions. Thank you so much.